Aloha, this is Think Tech Hawaii, and this show is Politics for the People. Um, I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton, and our topic today is what have we learned from the January 6th Select Congressional Committee? And this is about the insurrection of last January 6th, which we're celebrating the anniversary of today. And for that, we have a discussion panel of guests to analyze uh, statements and talk about statements submitted by local political analysts. And uh, our panel of guests to do that discussion and analysis talk is uh, comprised of Jay Fidel, Tim Apicello, Winston Welch, and, uh, and Cynthia Lee Sinclair. Welcome, panel. Good well, morning. Um, the, the statements that we will be discussing shortly um, are, are, are written by uh, the following three political analysts, and they are Cynthia Tai of the Project Expedite Justice and Sandy Ma uh, from the Common Cause and Colin Moore, uh, um, a pr professor from the University of Hawaii. And then we will also have another entry after that. All right, so here we are, uh, I don't know if we should say celebrating, but marking um, the annual anniversary, the one year anniversary of the Capitol um, attack last year. Jay, can you talk, can you introduce us to the beginning of what it is you see as our learning from the January 6th committee? I'd like to see Colin Moore's statement and I'll comment on that. Okay. It can happen here. American democracy, far more fragile than even the most cynical among us ever imagined. In just four years, Donald Trump managed to so degrade our sacred institution, institutions that millions of Americans still cling to a belief that the 2020 election was rigged. Rather than reject those lies, the Republican Party, the party of Lincoln, has responded with cynical attempts to use this crisis to enhance its political power. Colin Moore is a political scientist trained at Harvard. He is the chair of political science in, at the University of Hawaii. And to hear him say those words, it's stunning because that's candid. That's, that's how it feels, but it's also a statement of just how serious the situation is. So I, I thank Colin for sending us those words. I thank Colin for being candid. Um, and I agree with him 100%. We are in a serious problem. You know, before the show began, I was watching MSNBC and other channels and, um, there's a you know a, a proceeding going on in, in the House uh, uh, where various uh, uh, Congress people are expressing their views about uh, the first year anniversary of the insurrection, and it, at a certain level, you know it's um, it's it's encouraging. It even calls for a may I say a, a Winstonian kind of. Uh, Optimism. May I say that, Winston? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know, the reality is Colin Moore and other statements we have received. Um, and it's nice that uh, they're commemorating this and sp lo speaking lofty thoughts about, you know, how democracy um, has been, can be, will be saved. But it's not at all clear to me. And if you ask me what I would put down on one of those testimonials, I would say the insurrection and the year following the insurrection has shown us that democracy is broken. And, and I am no more optimistic today than I was then. Jay, Colin Moore also wrote just um, at the end of his statement. Yeah, what he said was what we've learned is that America is not special. Our democracy only works because people believe that the norms and institutions uh, are more important than the outcome of any election. I mean, I, I think when he says that, he means 
democracy, if it's working, uh, shows you that. But it's not working, frankly. If we don't change course from what happened and what has happened since, uh, we'll join the ranks of other nations whose democratic uh, ex ex experiments uh, ended in chaos and uh, violence. Well, I think that's clear also. And I agree with him on that also. I agree with everything he said. And so I, th I think we're on the road to chaos and violence. And Think Tech will cover it. We here will be, you know, commenting on it. Um, and we can refer back to this language and say, gee whiz, he was prophetic, wasn't he? All right. Uh, and, and we will, for sure. Um, and uh, yes, so Tim, let's uh, look at another comment from uh, Project Expedite Justice um, Executive Director Cynthia Tai. And she, her piece um, has kind of a cadence to it because she, she writes, we have learned that America is just like other struggling democracies and they govern by power and control. She starts out with that. Tim, do you see it that way also? Um, no, I, I think you mentioned the term American exceptionalism. And I, I think Americans for 200 years thought we are the beacon of light for the world about our democracy. And, and, and frankly, I think we were a little smug about it. I think we turned our nose down at those countries struggling to form a constitution and struggle to maintain a democracy, particularly in South American countries. And, and you know, now in the Eastern Bloc, uh, what we used to call the Eastern Bloc. Um, and I think that kind of smugness made us apathetic to the realities that face us and have been facing us certainly for the last five years. And you know, yesterday on our my show, I, I mentioned that democracy could be with a snap of a finger or you know the ink of a pen uh, via an executive order snatched away from people. And the example I used was 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans, uh, excuse me, Americans with Japanese ancestry that had their freedoms usurped in a stroke of a pen, and they were incarcerated for three years. Uh, it could, if it happened then, it certainly can happen now, and it is happening now. We just don't see it uh, unfold as quickly as one might expect. And it, it's sad because you can see something slip away and you know it's slipping away, but no one's noticing or they don't wanna notice. And I think that's part of because, again, American exceptionalism, it's this arrogance, it's this hubris that we have about our democracy and how dare someone suggest that it could go away because we're the greatest. Um, so I find it sad and tragic and something can be done about it. And I think something will be done about it. And as mentioned in today's show um, with President Biden and all the, uh, the speakers in the House, um, it's accountability. And without accountability, you have no justice. And without justice, you do have the demise of democracy. And um, that's just my initial thought. Well, her, her cadence goes on in her comment. Uh, she says, we learned that politicization and social media fuels the pandemic from mask wearing to vaccines, placing our right to life in grave danger. Many wrongly use the right to choose argument. We learned that democracy and the rule of law are at great risk. We learned that politicians are not promoting accountability. We know that political inaction invites repetition. We learn that most Americans take democracy for granted. We learn that most Americans choose entertainment over democratic values. And we learn that democracy is fragile and Americans will learn the hard way through chaos and violence. Um, do you have, what, what thoughts do you have on those comments, Tim? My comment is that violence will win the day if we allow it. And uh, we have to fortify the rule of law. It's not just to have the laws on the books, it's to have cooperation to follow the law. And I hate to say it, but it's time for us to identify those who are gleefully and willing to s subvert our democracy and, and, and make them known. And that be it a politician, be it Donald Trump himself, let it be known of their, their actions and their involvement to what happened a year ago on January 6th. Let us all know what they've done along the way in the last four years to undermine the institutions of our democracy. What was their role? 
identify them. I'm not looking for a McCarthy witch hunt here. I'm looking for accountability and justice. And it's time that we stop trying to be politically correct in all things that we do. And it's time to identify that which is very wrong. And it's time to ferret it out and identify it and move on. But without identifying what happened and who was behind it, uh, we are stuck and on a pathway to violence and indifference. Thank you. Um, Winston, we have another comment submitted by Sa uh, Sandra Ma, Ma and uh, from Common Cause. And uh, she says, January 6th was the culmination of years long constant assault on common decency, the rule of law, science, and facts. Still, no one seems to have learned that there are several consequences for spreading lies, fostering hate, and stoking prejudices. It shreds our democracy. Social media continues to amplify false narratives of stolen election and voter fraud. Some in the media fail to hold power accountable and highlight false equivalencies through wrongful both sides-ism reporting. Some of our elected officials continue to find an ever lower common denominator to pander to instead of acting with the urgency needed for these times. This country, all its people, must be better and do better for our nation to heal and for democracy to recover. Um, she talks about uh, many things, Winston. Did any particularly stand out uh, to you? Why don't you put it on the screen, Stephanie? Yeah. Why don't, why don't you put her statement on the screen? I know it's hard to not have the statement. Eric, can you put the statement up? Yeah. She's a very eloquent uh, spokesperson, and I think anybody uh, watching our show needs to go to Common Cause Hawaii and donate some money. Uh, uh, Sandy Masso uh, eloquently represents what's happened in our nation. As she said, this you know we're, we're you know looking out for for entertainment, and the lowest common denominator often takes precedent there. Um, media not being uh, holding people accountable. Well, you know it, the news, national news, always ends with the happy moment of the day with the puppy coming home or, or you know whatever instead of when you really look at it and you look at the number of words that you see in the, in the uh, nightly news broadcast it doesn't even fill a page of the newspaper so you have to really be a committed and dedicated person if you're really looking for news in this country um the lack of uh, civility uh, and treating each other with respect and common decency, that struck out at me as well. Just stopping demonizing other people for holding a different point of view. Uh, you know, yeah, the, the dehumanizing of that so that that other that other becomes enemy rather than just other idea. This is the country where the best ideas are supposed to percolate to the top. She mentioned about uh, and, uh, science uh, being disregarded, basic science. Uh, we, you, uh, I'm sorry, but that's what we use is basic science in this nation. It's very easy to jump on mistakes that people do to look at the CDC and say, oh, they flip flopped here, they flipped out there. Therefore, I'm not gonna believe them, it's fake. It's, uh, you know, on, on, on policies like vaccines. The reality is, though, that whatever it is, you mentioned uh, social media, which actually has sort of looked at itself a little bit better and is doing some some cleanup there and, and removing things. I noticed they Twitter gave Marjorie Taylor Greene a one out of four sort of warning flags, I think based on soccer. I don't know where that came from, but if you get two or three or four, you get a lifetime ban. But um, because of something that she'd said. Yes, it's a lack of accountability inside of our own parties and our peoples. What's happened, I think, though, is all of this together. And uh, it was NPR came out with a with a good um, article today. It was uh, our January 5th called uh, uh, They Believe in Trump's Big Lie. Here's why it's been so hard to dispel. And it talks about how our very identities have been become wrapped in uh, this partisanship more than any other thing, more than race or, or religion or uh, ethnic background, age, all of the demographics. And so when we try to approach and, and talk to other people like we normally used to, and I think that we can get back to, there's also a, a CBS YouGov uh, poll that came out today that basically says, we have way more in common than we don't. And politics tends to poke us and excite us 
and there's a few really loud, noisy people. So wherever we can, let's follow Sandy's good advice, which is to say, this is what's happened. What's the antidote for that? What's the antidote for demonizing somebody saying, I appreciate that you have a different point of view. Let's look at that. Okay. Right. You're addressing her final comment, the final sentence, which she, in which she said, this country, um, all its people must be better and do better for the nation to heal and to recover and democracy to recover. So can you're addressing this, what, what must be done? So can you be a little more specific about what must be done to be better and do better that, that you're beginning to discuss? You know, it's, it's a great question because we, we've, we've, sort of grappled with otherism uh, for since the dawn of humanity but now we're in everything and is in a 30 second news cycle TikTok. um you know part of this uw uh, yougov cbs poll came out that says 51 percent of people have politics have been a factor in deciding whether to be friends with a person 39 percent vaccine status 31 percent religion 28 percent cultural background it's very interesting politics is right at the very top of this new tribalism so well, uh, you know, and I, I know many people, they said, I have um, uh, cut off all people who are in the other the, the, the other party, if you're, if, if, you're, if you're ostensibly liberal. And these are terms that are not really um, true anymore. Uh, liberal, conservative, this party of Lincoln, that's a nice, that's a nice thing to say. But does the Republican Party look anything like the party of Lincoln? Does the Democratic Party at the time of Lincoln look anything like the Democratic Party today? No. Uh, es essentially, we're, uh, it's coming down to, as she says, each of us must make these things, but it needs to bleed all the way up and all the way down. And we need to hold, we need to write to our representative and say, this is reprehensible that you've said this type of thing about your colleague in the Senate. Or could you please use a more civil tone when you're dealing with other people? We have serious problems. We need to handle them together. And seeing each other as enemy is not the answer. Rather saying, you may have a different idea than I do. And I'm going to listen to it because it may be a superior position to mine. And if it is, I will adopt it. And that's the way that we have run in this country and hopefully do run in this country. Um, we got a lot of work to do on that. So better and to do better. And those are uh, specifics that I'd ask about. Thank you. We, um, Eric, do we have Cynthia Sinclair's? Aloha. Here at Think Tech Hawaii, we have had several long running shows about the current state of politics. CEO and founder Jay Fidel asked hosts to answer the question, since January 6th, what have we learned? I'm Cynthia Sinclair, a Think Tech host. Here are some of my answers to that question. We have learned that a large majority of Republicans think that violence has become an acceptable way to get what you want. Hate, racism, and lies have become the norm for a large vocal violent swath of our country. We have learned that the word patriot has been twisted through misinformation to mean something new and dangerous. We have learned that the big lie that has been propagated by the Republican Party is still being pushed on anyone who will listen, sowing doubt and undermining people's trust in our elections, leading to new state laws that remove nonpartisan election officials and gives power to partisan politicians. We have learned that right-wing media has become a dangerous threat that is undermining democracy, eroding the fabric of truth, and destroying established norms. They are the biggest purveyor of the big lie and other machinations of disinformation. They are actively working to divide and polarize our nation. We have learned that accountability is the missing piece that has put our democracy in danger. Some 700 insurrectionists have been arrested, but only a handful have been charged. Most were given light sentences. The lack of severe penalties has given the appearance that what happened wasn't so bad, something the right-wing media has used to foster extremism and promote the big lie. 
We have learned that behind the scenes, the January 6th committee has interviewed over 300 people connected with the attack on the Capitol. They have received thousands of documents, phone logs, and text messages. Last weekend, we were told that the committee now has firsthand accounts that the former president was watching the insurrection from his private dining room at the White House. He was being urged by many people to speak out and tell the rioters to stop. He refused. And what's more, during the speech Trump gave at the Ellipse on the 6th, he told the people in attendance that Mike Pence could still come through for them. When the insurrection was in full swing, Trump tweeted that Mike Pence was not going to come through for them. After he tweeted that, the rioters began to chant, hang Mike Pence. We have learned that we are at great risk for losing our democracy to autocratic rule. We are officially listed as a democracy in decline. And finally, we have learned that we must be intentional, ready to stand strong against this onslaught of misinformation and lies. We must all stand up, unafraid, and speak truth to power before it's too late. Jay, can you talk about how she has covered, how Cynthia Lee Sinclair's comment covered the learnings we have now from the January 6th committee? And perhaps you can add more. Uh, she's tracking on um, saying the same thing I was saying is that since January 6th, we could be disappointed. Now, it's very interesting that in the, in the week or two following uh, January 6th, a number of Republican bigwigs, uh, including Mitch McConnell and others, um, you know, said, oh, that's terrible what happened, and, and Trump is responsible, and you ought to be ashamed of himself. But soon enough, and this is a remarkable phenomenon, soon enough, they turned. They said, oh, he's not so bad. Uh, and it's just a couple of people out on a Sunday, a Sunday picnic. Um, and it's incredible how the lies filtered back into the public conversation. And then, of course, um, you know, the, the Democrats caused there to be a, an impeachment, the second one. Um, and uh, that that didn't go anywhere because Republicans all voted against it, including McConnell. And so, um, you know, what what happened here is that it all sort of returned home to the base. And since then, they have been uh, more, more strategic, more strident, uh, more, more destructive, as she says, uh, than they, they were in the past. It is really incredible. Um, so I, I agree with Cynthia, too. I'm not optimistic about this. And although today we celebrate uh, maybe democracy or the survival of democracy, so many things have happened in the past year that suggests that democracy is on a, a visible decline in this country. Uh, and yes, we can talk about it. And as, as uh, Tim says, we can, we can call them out about it. And, that, and we should, and we should do that right here. We are an example of calling them out on it. Um, however, query whether that's going to work, because they can sit back smug and say, well, we have a dozen, at least a dozen states where he totally screwed up the voting process. OK, and when it comes down to November of 2022, this year, uh, what, nine months away, 10 months away, uh, you're going to see the fruit of our efforts. You're going to see an election that turns upside down again. I shouldn't say again, it turns upside down in the way that Trump wanted it to turn upside down. So <clears throat> what we have here is uh, it's a moment of light here and celebrating the, you know, the anniversary, but it's uh, it's it's euphemistic. And uh, at the end of the day, we have we have lost uh, uh, we have lost touch with each other, with the country, with democracy, with the rule of law and with any sense of the future. And I always say, if, you know, we're going to have violence. And if you need a dentist, you're going to be you're going to be wondering if you did the right thing. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Tim, can you can you add to the learnings list we now have from the work of the January 6th committee? Can you? Um... Um, I'm going to take a little bit more globally uh, rather than specifically just January 6th. And that is, I think, in the last during the entire Trump administration, with all 
the things that the president of the United States did, the, the way he tried to implement policies, whether people thought they were good or bad, but the way he tried to implement them, the attacks on our institutions, the loading of his, his cronies and his faithful lackeys, the undermining of our, 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 our democratic institutions, um, told me one thing, and that is the love of money, the love of the position of power exceeded our elected officials oath the office to maintain the rule of law and to defend the Constitution of the United States. Power and money exceeded their oath, their oath before the public and to God. And if we learned anything, we have to be vigilant about human beings and how money and power corrupts. And absolute power corrupts absolutely. And um, I, we shouldn't forget this lesson and we should remember it come time for the next ballot box in 2022. Very good point. Thank you. Winston, um, what are we going to do about this list? Is it sufficient or um, do we have more learning to do? Can you talk about what more learning the January 6th committee must achieve to get us to these goals well stated by panelists and our commentators? Oh boy, do we have a list. We have a long, long list. Maybe Think Tech needs to start a show called Deepening Democracy or something like that, or getting back to our roots or something where we look at all of the disparate elements that have come in to combine that allowed uh, Donald Trump to be elected in the first place, that uh, has allowed this complete um, abdication of responsibility uh, since and, 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 and just running from pure facts since January 6th that has allowed this division to happen, whether it's media, whether it's social media, whether it's a politician, sociopathism, economic divides, whatever it is, we need to take the deep dive over a long period of time. I don't know that we have that period of time right now, but we do it, we must. And so, you know, the other thing is that Let's start going back and treating each other as best as we can on an individual level, because that's really where it may make the difference. As that NPR article said, look for the cracks where you can plant a seed, because when you come for a full frontal assault and said, you're bad, you're wrong, you're evil, it's not going to go anywhere, but strengthen a position on that. So let's go back and appeal to each other's common sense of decency uh, and wanting to be heard on a human level. And for that, we need to be vulnerable ourselves. As well. So I think, uh, you know, I, I would like to end with optimism on this show that, as I normally do, uh, we were tested a year ago. January 6th should be a day of fasting and prayer or community service, something where you get back and you say, this country matters. The ideals of this country matter. And I have to do my part, whatever it is, to make that happen. Thank you. Okay, we're out of show time. And thank yous and mahalos go to our commentators. That's uh, Colin Moore, uh, Cynthia Tai, and uh, Sandy Ma, who provided their, their statements of uh, what we have learned from the January 6th committee. I also want to thank, and those comments were stimulus for the discussion today of Jay Fidel, Tim Apicello, Winston Welch, and um, Cynthia Lee Sinclair's comment is also appreciated. So we'll see you next week and aloha.